Welcome to the Jewelry Connoisseur Podcast. And now your host, Sonia Esther Soltani. Welcome to this new episode of the Jewelry Connoisseur Podcast. I'm your host today, Sonia Esther Soltani. I'm the editor in chief at Rapapo, and my guest is Vanessa Cron. Hi, Vanessa. How are you? Hi, I'm very well. And you? All I'm good? good, thank you. So I'm just going to introduce you, but I think most people who love jewelry and estate jewelry know your name and either are already following you on Instagram for your Instagram account called Jewels and the Gang, which is such an amazing source of uh, insights and knowledge into jewelry. And Vanessa is also a teacher at Head Geneva, the School of Art and Design, ISG Luxury Management School of Geneva, and also is uh, overlooking the jury courses at Christie's Education. And Vanessa has a long experience at working at Christie's as a jury archivist and senior cataloger. So she has so much insights into jewelry that I'm so happy to, to have her on the podcast today. Thank you. And then today we thought, let's just look at one design designer house, the house of René Boivin. Um, I saw a post on Instagram a while ago and Vanessa said how much she loved Boivin. And I thought, okay, if I have to, to choose one subject for you, let's do this one. <laughs> <laughs> Very good indeed. That's, but I have to say it's my favorite house. So Perfect. So, <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> so, and it's, I know it's also a very popular maison in terms of estate jewelry and dealers love having beautiful pieces of Boivin and sharing them with their customers and collectors. And uh, some pieces have made it to museums. We'll, we'll speak ab about it a bit later. But what makes a Boivin jewel recognizable and different? Well, I have to say the Maison Boivin is a very peculiar one. It's one that is very well known amongst the jury historians or experts, but also it's one that is not so well known from the general public, even some jury lovers. I mean, it, I, I have to say it's very different from the traditional jury houses that we all know of. Boivin is a very different house, and this is for many reasons, in fact. First one probably is the fact that the house does not really exist anymore. And that means the house has not been active for more than 25 years. So, of course, you won't see out there right now or in the last uh, years some new creations by Boivin. So, of course, it, it doesn't help for the promotion of a name. Second is that I would say the Boivin jewels have not really been following the main characteristics of the style period they were created in, mostly. And also, as it was a somewhat small jury house, a house that had just one location in the world, in Paris, not even having a store, I'm talking ground floor display on the street store, um, it's not exactly the same kind of promotion that you will have from traditional houses like, say, Cartier or Van Cleef and Albers. And I mean, lastly, as the jewels are not always signed, and mostly are not, uh, it's not very easy to identify them. So... To identify and know the jewels by Boivin, I would say my only advice would be the more you see them, the more you understand and recognize them. It's really a question of feeling. Uh, if there's one thing about Boivin, it's a real style. It's a spirit also. It's, it's an idea of jewelry, I would say. And the more you see them, the more you identify the core of, of the spirit behind it. It's, it's really, there is something very different to whatever else you might find. Um, it's also interesting because the more you understand uh, Boivin jewelry, the more you recognize how much it has inspired so many jewelers in different areas. So, in fact, you find a bit of Boivin in many jewels that I see today. I'm not saying it's copied. I'm just saying it, it has inspired. This spirit and the style has inspired a lot of jewelers. Um, to identify them, I would say there is still an official reference if we can say so, which is the only book ever written on René Boivin. It was written in 1994 by François Sky. Uh, it's a great book. It's, it's really a Bible for whoever loves uh, René Boivin. Problem is, it's out of print and is now extremely expensive to, to buy. It's a collector's piece. I think it sells, it sells for a few thousand dollars. I mean, it's the price of a little painting by a... By... Completely crazy, the price. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. I have to say, it's just personal anecdote. I'm very proud of myself that I bought one 15 years ago for 60 euros, I think, or something like this. Oh, wow. So, Vanessa, you really hold to a, to a piece of history. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's my Bible. So, of course, I'm so happy to have it. But I have to say now, because it's been out of print for so many years and there's not another book written on Boivin, 
um, it's really the only official reference um, by expert Francoise Kai. Um, the thing is also you can go to, I would say, to auctions. That's a good way to see some of the jewels by Boivin because auction houses are selling some estate jewels from René Boivin. So it's a good way to make a sort of a catalog in your head of this type of jewels and this type of design. Also, the good thing with auction houses is that you can go and actually hold the pieces in your hand, the jewels, which is very important when it comes to Boivin. For the good reason that the most important things, I would say, um, in, the, in the design at Boivin is really the feeling, I mean, touching them, the special volume, the special feel, the boldness of them. And I would say, in a way, maybe a certain sensuality in the way you, you, when you take them in your hand, because of the volume, the very sculptural aspect of the jewels. Um, so that's an important factor. When you hold Boivin jewels in your hand, then you will get this notion, the perspective, the sculptural aspect, the architectural type of aspect of the jewels. And lastly, I would say, of course, when you want to identify and recognize a piece, um, you have to take a loop, a jeweler loop, and then loop the, the jewel. So taking a look and looking at the jewel by Boivin, the problem is most of the jewels were not signed, which is very peculiar, but that's the way it is. Um, they, they were not really people signing the jewels. We say that a lot about Suzanne Belperon, uh, that, that of course you, you know of, um, that she, wasn't, she was never signing her pieces saying, my style is my signature, but it's for a good reason. It's because she's been trained at Boivin for 10 years. So in fact, she took that from the Boivin house. They were not really signing. So if you take a look, you might have some, you can still have some indications. They didn't sign, but they had a maker's mark. So if you look up close with the loop, you might find the little maker's mark for René Boivin, which says that it was created in their own workshop. Um, this little maker's mark looked like a vertical lozenge with two letters, R and B, of course, for René Boivin, and they're framing a snake in the middle, the shape of the snake. So this indication will tell you um, this is a Boivin jewel, but you can also find some workshop marks from other workshops because Boivin um, made some jewels in their own workshop, but they also used a lot of very important uh, jewelry workshop in Paris, including, for example, Atelier Robert Davier, which you will find with a mark, which is a horizontal lozenge and the letter RD framing a plane. It's just an example, but it gives you an sort of additional clue when you see a piece that, of course, if this workshop who worked mainly for Boivin has its mark on the piece, so maybe it's an additional clue that the jewel is by Boivin. So it's not very easy to recognize all the pieces by Boivin, but they have a specific style. And I would say at some point, Boivin is the house that when you see someone wearing a Boivin jewel, even 10 meters from you, probably you will recognize it if you've seen many of them. There is a specific style that it is very difficult to explain, but that you understand the more you see the pieces. That's very interesting. Just to put uh, René Boivin into context, he was born in 1864, passed away just uh, during the First World War in 1917, and yeah. he had a workshop, as you said, in Paris that was actually mm -hmm. uh, famous among jewelry collectors and lovers. I think just even before Cartier was the big name in this environment. Mm -hmm. And he married Jeanne Poiré, who was the sister of the one of the biggest couture designer, fashion designers of the time. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more, because you mentioned it already, but the genius of Boivin was never follow fashion somehow, to have a style like to design pieces that were inspired by nature, but that were not art nouveau. And then the, his followers, the, the, the other designers that work for him, you mentioned Suzanne Belperon, we'll, we'll speak a bit more about the women, but they were creating amazing pieces during Art Deco without being specifically Art Deco. So what was really the this style? I mean, how, however difficult it is to, to describe it, but you recognize it. So in fact, René Boivin is, as I said, a peculiar house for also another reason is that most of the jewels that you identify today as being René Boivin were not made by René Boivin. So the fact is that René Boivin was the founder of this house. He was the husband of Jeanne Poiret, who became Jeanne Boivin. 
Um, he founded his house in 1890. And the beginning of the production of René Boivin was pretty much the workshop was working for different houses, traditional ones. They were making jewels for Melerio, for different houses from the Place Vendôme. He was a master uh, jeweler. He was a master engraver that he had learned during his training when he was younger. But the beginning of his own creations arrived only at the turn of the century, I would say 1900, when he started to have his own client who would come to him. So he stopped at some point making jewel, jewels for the other houses. He didn't really follow at the time, 1900, most of the, the two styles in fashion in jewelry were Belle Epoque, what we call Belle Epoque, and then Art Nouveau. He made few jewels inspired by this type of movement and stylistic movements. But you could feel already that there was, it was, I would say, mostly traditional, but he already had something of a twist into his jewels because he was inspired by antique jewels, ancient jewels even, um, like Etruscan, Egyptian. And he started to make some jewels that had something of a ve already very sculptural aspect, which was very, I mean, it was probably inspired from the Art Nouveau, who had already this sort of sculptural aspect to the jewels, but also he developed it to something that was so much more important and, and really bold. So it was really the beginning of it, I would say. Um, he had some ideas already that were different from traditional joaillerie, And he also was a great art collector, which not so many people know about him, but he loved art. And that's why at the beginning, Boivin, between him and his wife, who, as you said, um, was the sister of Paul Poiret, they really were in a circle of people who were really art collectors, art educated art people, I would say, who knew about art, which was so difficult, I mean, at the time to be the jeweler for these type of people, not only for the wealthy people or the nouveau riche, as we said at the time during the Belle Epoque, Belle Epoque. it was really a jeweler who would really appeal to this audience that loved art. So it was probably the beginning of what would become then uh, the style of Boivin. But René Boivin himself, most of the jewels that he made are not the ones that you see today. Very few exist up to now, and it's difficult to recognize them because this mix of traditional and bold jewelry is not very easy to identify. But when he died in 1917, his wife, Jeanne Boivin, who had been working with him for, for a few years, not as a designer, though. She was helping him with the, with the company, but, but not as a designer. And she lost her husband during the war. Um, and then for a few years, she decided to, the few first years after his passing, she, she was really, she wanted to have this house to keep on living and to be a tribute to her husband, probably. That's why she never changed the name. It has always been René Boivin. She never changed it to just Boivin, for example. It was really René Boivin. And for a few years, she, she was, of course, probably so, so sad after the death of her husband that she just kept on um, working with the jewels that were made at the time. That's the beginning of what we can see of following a bit, but really slightly what has been done during the Art Deco period. So some jewels really are inspired by uh, Art, Deco, Art Deco style. But very quickly, she started to, to design her own jewels with her own mind. And as she was not a jeweler, nor a designer, she went with, I would say, inspiration. So she went with shapes, she went with colors, she went with different materials because she was not a traditional jeweler and had not been trained as such. So it makes a big difference because then her way to create jewels, although she was not, as I said, designing, like drawing herself a jewel, or she was not making them at the bench, she still had a very strong idea of what a jewel should look like. And it had to be to be very different from traditional eau joaillery. That's when the style of Boivin, as we know it now, started really. It was very much inspired by the personality, I would say, of René Boivin and his own designs, because he had made already some very bold, um, uh, stylish jewels. But she pushed it really much further, completely. And it's the beginning of what we know now as the Boivin style, um, she, as she was not a designer herself, she asked um, Suzanne Belperon and she hired Suzanne Belperon in 1919, who was a very young 
designer. She was 19, so she was very young. And for 10 years, they worked together. So the inspiration was coming from Jeanne Boivin, who had a very clear idea of what she was, wanted to do. And then Suzanne Belperon would um, draw and design the jewels, and then they would go to, to workshops, their own or external workshops, to have the jewels made. So it's a very different way of doing things. Jeanne Boivin has never wanted to have an actual store as you think of a traditional store. She didn't want to be on Rue de la Paix or Place Vendôme. Um, when you think about it, beginning of the 1920s, being a woman, being the head of this incredible jewelry house, having no shop, having just clients coming to you because they knew your style, it was, it was, really, it was really groundbreaking, I would say, in a way. Not that she ever th said that she was a designer, but she was, it was a, really a collective effort of the designer plus her plus the workshop. That's the way that the Boivin style, as we know it now, was created, I would say. And the amazing collaboration between Jeanne Boivin and Suzanne Belperon for 10 years, as you said, they both pushed the boundaries in terms of what you could use in, in gemstones or materials, maybe yeah. gemstones that were not considered high jewelry at the time, but because mm -hmm. of the artistic vision they had. So can you tell us a bit more about some of the pieces that, that, that appeared during this collaboration? Yes. Yeah, so I would say the most important of the jewels that were created during this period of time, these 10 years, was probably, in fact, in inspired not only by Jeanne Boivin and Suzanne Belperon, but by an external um, workshop, the workshop of Adrien Louard. He was a lapidary, so he was a master on the, in the ecliptic art, meaning he would carve stones, gemstones. So he was carving quartz, chalcedony, all types of stones. And it was very much an inspiration for these two women who really started to include some stones that were not the traditional precious stones that we know of, meaning the diamond, the emerald, the, the ruby and the sapphire. Not saying that they did not use it, saying that they would also head to different types of materials, started to create these rings that were the actual ring, the actual hoop was made of a carved agate, for example, and then you would set a stone into a stone. So that there was no, the, the hoop, the total of the ring was not made of gold or made of platinum. It was really made of, of an actual gemstone. So it was very different from whatever else you could see. Also because it had a lot of the curves, the polish of these stones, the way they would be attracted more, more by, I would say, cabochon, for example, um, gives a different aspect to the jewel. So it's the Boivin style is pretty much also an association of colors. So these colors that were not supposed, especially during the Art Deco period, which you might know has been a lot into the two-tone style, the black and white mainly, but not only, but it was very a two-tone type of, and two-dimensional also, very two-dimensional type of jewels. And the combination of Boivin, Jeanne Boivin and Suzanne Belperon really led to the creation of these bold, sculptural, colorful jewels made of agate, chalcedony, whatever you can imagine, citrines, which, are, which were not the type of stones used at the time, really, or not in this amount, I would say. So that's the beginning of this style that Suzanne Belperon had a very specific style. When she left the house in 1932, she continued and successfully with her own style. But she infused this into the, the spirit of the Boivin house, helped a lot, I would say, by Jeanne Boivin, who I think is really the one that most people don't talk about and who is at the origin of all of this, because she was overseeing everything. Of course, also because she didn't know so much about actual jury making. Uh, it is said that she was very difficult and tough with the workshops because she had this clear idea in her head that something could be done. And she would come to them and they would say, we can't do this. It's not possible. And she insisted until it was done. Mm -hmm. So she pushed them. I mean, there's a story that she had one of the head of the most important workshop in Paris to cry because she kept on coming back saying, nope, you redo this. Because she had a clear idea that this could be done. So of course she pushed it because as she didn't know how to make it, she thought it was possible. So she, pu she pushed also the boundaries in the way 
things were made because she liked also that things were, as I said, a bit central in, in the way that you hold the pieces. That means flexibility is important. The way you can transform the jewels uh, is important. The three-dimensional aspect of the and sculptural aspect was important. And this had to be, of course, created by the workshops uh, based on their design of Suzanne Belperon. So it's a sort of really a combination of all these people very skilled people, Suzanne Belperon being a very skilled designer, Jeanne Boivin with her strong inspiration and, and who did not fear uh, going to places that no one else was going to. It was said that no one could really ask her something. She would do whatever she wanted and that she was clearly not a traditional jury house, that's for sure. And then all the workshops outside, the one of Loire, as I said, the one of Robert Davier, I, I talked about him, these people all together uh, really managed to create this style that we know now, that we can sort of identify now. Also, an important factor is that probably they were some of the only jewelers um, in Paris in the 20s to use yellow gold, for example, because the, you know, the fashion was platinum and diamonds and onyx and two-dimensional geometric incredible jewels, stylized jewels. And then they would come with something that was yellow gold, sculptural with cabochons. It was so different. People are saying that when you would go to Boivin to buy a jewel, you didn't go to buy a jewel. You would, you would go to buy a Boivin jewel because that's what you wanted to have. So she had a very loyal client base, I would say, because they knew her, they knew they would get there something that no one else had. And that would make, make them also stand out in a way, which was very important. So she's probably, Jeanne Boivin is probably the one who, who started this in a way, I would say. And this style comes from her. Even if after that, Suzanne Belperon, of course, has been the one, in fact, putting it into the design. And then later, after Suzanne Belperon, Juliette Moutard, and also Germaine Boivin, who was the daughter of Jeanne Boivin and René Boivin, who also uh, joined the house and was a designer too. So all these women, interesting because the name of the house is René Boivin, and he's a man. And in fact, all of the jewels that you probably know and like and love from Boivin have been made by women. We used to call it the Atelier des Dames, so maybe the ladies' workshop or something like this, because in fact, it was all made by women, and designers and the owner of the house. They were all women, which, as you can imagine, they were not the only one. Huh? I'm not saying that uh, Jeanne Boivin was the only female jeweler in, in the whole world. It's not true. A lot of women jewelers have been around for, for a long time, but she really had an important house. And, and in the 20s, being, being the owner of such a house was not so easy, especially when you work with workshop, which were clearly mainly the workers were, were really men. And it was somehow, I would say, difficult, but they understood that she was different and she wanted something different. And it shows in the jewels. It completely shows in the jewels. So Suzanne Belberon probably had a very sculptural design um, in a way already in her mind that she translated into her designs. A lot of curves. And she also took the inspiration that René Boivin had already, being very inspired by exotic uh, jewels, by faraway art, by ancient art and the, the swirls and all these type of antique jewels. She really took it for herself and, and redesigned them in her own specific way. That's the beginning of this time, exactly. And what was the, the relation, the collaboration, Jeanne Boivin and Juliette Moutard? Was it because that's a bit of a different style from, uh, from Suzanne Bell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in fact, uh, when Suzanne Bell Perron left uh, in 1932, because she wanted to sort of go on, on her own, I would say, and then she went to work with Bernard Hertz to, to create her own house, Juliette Moutard uh, was hired to replace uh, Suzanne Belperon. She, Juliette Moutard stayed for almost 40 years at René Boivin. So she's really, I would say, the main style of René Boivin jewelry is in fact something inspired and completely designed by Juliette Moutard. Of course, she was directed by Jeanne Boivin and she was inspired by what had been done before. When she started Juliette Moutard, she more or less for a few years worked on what had been done right before her. That means Belle Perron style. So you have some jewels that at some point you can't really identify being Belle Perron or Juliette Moutard for really the mid 1930s because they pretty much look alike. They have the same sort of feel to it. And then Juliette Moutard went, started to develop her own style and then completely apart from what had been done Belle Perron. 
and then went into a type of jewelry that was probably more not figurative or naturalistic, but she was very much inspired by nature because Jeanne Boivin was very much inspired by nature. And so they went into this, um, taking this route of bold sculptural animals, plants, flowers that are really the signature style of Boivin. So Juliette Moutin was also very interested into the make of the jewels and the fact that you could transform them and the flexibility of them. So she was very much into this technical aspect. Although we see her as, as a designer, I think she was very involved into the technical aspect that would make the jewels that she had designed have a feel and a flexibility that was and a volume that was relevant to her design. So that's what made completely the, definitely, I would say, the style of Boivin. And where were some of her uh, iconic creations? I mean, one is, as I think most people have seen, maybe not in real life, but the starfish brooch that belonged to Claudette Colbert that was acquired by the, the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. I think it was last year. I think it was sold by Sigelson in New York with uh, rubies and amethyst and this beautiful like red and purple colors. What were other of her creations today people could, could acquire either in auction houses or also at, at estate dealers? Well, in fact, this starfish is probably the most iconic of pieces, probably because if you take one in your hand, you're going to understand. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I mean, of course, the design itself is the one of a starfish. So Jeanne Boivin was very inspired by everything um, coming from the sea. So a lot of shells, a lot of fish. It's really all these elements as design were very important to her. And so maybe Juliette Moutard was inspired by a conversation with Jeanne Boivin. We know that Jeanne Boivin used to take to her office some little shells that she would put on her desk and she, because she was inspired by the shapes and she loved them. So probably Juliette Moutard at some point was inspired and designed this starfish. Uh, several things about this starfish and why it's so iconic. First, it was made mid-30s. The design is from 1935, and probably the first one was made in 1936 for actress Claudette Colbert. The thing is, first, the combination of color, as we said, rubies and faceted rubies with cabochon amethyst, which is very unusual to all type of jewelry from the time, absolutely. The fact that this jewel is really very large. I mean, if you look at it, when you imagine a starfish, it's probably almost the size of an actual starfish. When you put it in your hand, it takes all of your hand. It's really large. You might find some images on the internet where you would see Millicent Rogers, for example, wearing hers, or Claudette Colbert wearing hers, and you will see the sheer size of it. It's not a small, tiny little brooch. It's a proper starfish on your coat that you're wearing. And lastly, this is only something that you can understand when you hold it. The flexibility of this starfish makes it seem alive when you have it on your hand because it moves. I mean, it moves. <laughs> I don't want to say that it moves. Like, it's not that it moves like an actual real one, but still, it's not a stiff brooch. It really is completely articulated. And when you take it, you feel a small movement. that is so, it's very strange. It, it gives you a bit of goosebumps. It has something very special. So I would say it's an iconic piece because not so many have been made by uh, Boivin. It really shows the core and the real spirit of the house with this bold, colorful, flexible type of jewels. So this one is famous because also, as you said, it's now part of a museum in Boston. So it's a very important piece of jewelry. I would say not for Boivin, it's an important piece of jewelry, period, because a style that has inspired so many jewelers afterwards. But I would say another iconic piece for me of Boivin is probably the tiger shoulder brooch that was made during the 50s by René Boivin, and which was sold at auction a few years ago in Geneva at Christie's in 2013, I think. And it belonged to Hélène Rochas, who was the wife of fashion designer Marcel Rochas. This incredible piece, again, very flexible, is in fact very interesting because you put it on your shoulder. It's not a brooch that you put on a coat or you put on your... It's really something that sits on your shoulder. So it looks like the tiger is in fact sitting on your shoulder as if you had it, as if you had like a, a little bird on your shoulder or something. It's the same with this tiger. And it's again, the very different vision and really aspect of jewelry that is so different from anything else that you have seen. It's different in the volume. It's different in the colors. When you wear it, it's really what makes it the complete style of 
weather. A lot of animals, a lot of flowers, a lot of leaves, but also some more abstract type of jewels, but always inspired by something that was coming an origin, I would say. For example, as I said, René Boivin himself used to be inspired by um, antique jewelry, ancient jewelry, and he also made some actual copies of them, mentioning it, like there were copies of Pompeii jewels, for example. He made this. He made some jewels that were inspired by Etruscan or Roman Empire, and he called them the barbaric jewels. And this kept on being infused into the jewels of, of Boivin much after his, his passing. I have to say also that Juliette Moutard, Suzanne Belperon, and Germaine Boivin, who were the main designers of the house for many years, were not the only one because when Juliette Moutard retired in 1970, she was replaced by a young designer named Marie-Caroline de Brosse, who was the last designer at Boivin until the, the 1990s. So she stayed for 20 years. And a lot of people are a bit overlooking the jewels from the 70s and 80s at Boivin. But in fact, they should look into it a bit more because she really managed to get the spirit of, of the house, maybe in a less naturalistic way, but really with the same idea of sculptural, the same idea of colors. And she, she was really the last of the women, I would say, in the, in the designers of the house until the house, is, uh, the house closed down in the 1990s. So in fact, all these women together managed to create a style that is unique, completely unique, and that I can identify right now in many jewels that I see created nowadays. Oh, that's fantastic. I think you gave us, you know, because you, you hear the name, you see the pieces, but I think, I hope our listeners have, have a better understanding and also this curiosity to go and, and look for more information now about, about René Boivin. I think most of it will be online because, as we said earlier, the, the reference book is unfortunately out of reach for most people. And I would say if people really want to understand what I say when I say that the style of Boivin is unique, I would really give an advice is go and look online if you can find a photo of the chameleon brooch by René Boivin. So a chameleon brooch that looks like a chameleon that was made at the time of Juliette Moutard. And it's very difficult to explain if you don't see it, but just to say it's in the shape, it's a yellow gold chameleon set with... Um, rubies and emeralds and in fact when you pull the tongue of the chameleon there is a rolling the body is rolling and then it shows different colors because it shows the rubies or it shows the emeralds so it was a playful sculptural object in the shape of an animal but it just to show the, the type of idea that was behind the design of Boivin. it was playful it was sculptural it was different and this is not attached to any style so it's timeless absolutely and i think as as it was at the beginning with jeanne and, and rené being art collectors and surrounded to mm -hmm. a whole cycle of art lovers today the people who exactly. collect have this appreciation for, for art as well and real craftsmanship yeah exactly they were also because their circle as you were saying of course because of paul poiret also they were known as a sort of jewelers of the intelligentsia if i can say not to say that it was not meant to be for everyone it also it was a very discreet house in a way because there was not really any promotion jean boivin absolutely didn't want to have a shop so it's you know it's, it's like educated circles that would know about them so that's how they also had the freedom to develop jewels that were not, in a way, the traditional Ojoairi, because they were completely free to do that, because it was really for their own circle at the beginning, and that's how it became a style, because they were completely free, and because the client who would buy some Boivin jewels absolutely didn't want to have traditional jewels. They pushed also the house to, to go and do different type of designs. So that, that made for this house to become what it is now, being really an inspiration as, as a, a free company that had really the freedom to design past the boundaries of traditional Ojoiri. Uh, I would recommend everyone who has the chance, if you can go and see pieces, some of the leaf brooches were by Boivin at estate dealers once they reopen and you're able to go and ask questions and you know ask to touch and, and see the volumes and the play on, on gemstones and material. It's remarkable. So I hope that will be after this podcast, people will, will feel like they want to, to see for themselves what it means to be by, by Boivin. Yes, exactly. Go to estate jewelers, go to auction houses, and they have very few of Boivin pieces, as you can imagine, because it's not so wide of a production that you have so many in stores. 
but but you can still find some and the few that that are there if you can and take them in your hand and wear them on you wear the jewels so you can see yourself wearing them it's really impressive thank you so much Vanessa thank you for your time and all your insights and as I said if you don't follow jewelry historian and consultant Vanessa Con yet on Instagram I would recommend you do it right now it's called Jewels and the Gang and every single caption it's not just it's about the pictures but it's really about the captions and all the histories and stories that Vanessa shares on a regular basis is the to a fan club I would say <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would really I would really encourage you you find some web you. pieces and you'll see a lot of other amazing designers there. thank you yeah. so much Vanessa thank you very much thank you and I'm looking forward to your next courses and insights thank you very much and on this note I will this is the end of this podcast and we'll see you in two weeks with a new episode of the Jewelry Corner so thank you very much bye bye Thanks for joining us at the Jewelry Connoisseur Podcast. If you enjoyed this and would like more top quality jewelry content, check out the Jewelry Connoisseur blog at jewelryconnoisseur.net. 